Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, as always, we, uh, we do these events three times a week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. If you're watching this on YouTube and you want to join us live, there's a link in the description to the London Ayn Rand Meetup where you can sign up to all of these events and join the discussion on Zoom. Um, and if not, we will continue posting uh, the discussions on YouTube. The topic for tonight is, is Atlas shrugging? Now, uh, th this is a question that comes up from time to time, regardless of, uh, of the situation, and certainly in times of crisis, uh, and it's undoubtedly going to come up now uh, with government expanding its powers and, and not really uh, being clear on, on uh, when we might return to normal in, in the legal sense. Um, so with us uh, to discuss this topic, we have Rob Trzinski. He is the editor of the Trzinski Letter and author of uh, the recently released So Who is John Galt Anyway? Uh, a Reader's Guide to Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrug, which does have a chapter titled Is Atlas Shrugging uh, in that book. So uh, we look forward to hearing from him. And we have Dr. Andrew Bernstein, author of the also recently released Heroes, Legends, Champions, why Heroism Matters, which you can get um, if you're in London at an upcoming Ayn Rand Center UK event, uh, but we don't have any scheduled at the moment, so you can also get it on Amazon. Uh, and chairing this discussion is Ayn Rand Center UK academic advisor, Nikos Sotirakopoulos. Nikos, over to you. Right, thank you very much. So, uh, we know the rules. You for those of you who want to ask questions, you click on participants and you raise your hand, then you have priority or you write your question in the chat. So let's start with Robert. Hi there. You should hold up a copy of your book, Rob. Yeah, I, I'm just kicking myself because I don't have one within arm's reach here. To, right, hold to on hold a up. second, you, you talk, I'll go get a copy. Okay, great, I appreciate that, Andy. Uh, yeah, the book is called So Who is John Galt Anyway? A Reader's Guide to Atlas Shrugged. It's a sort of connected series of essays uh, that, I, uh, that I wrote over a period of five years or so. Everything from the literary aspects of Atlas Shrugged, the historical context. Ah, there it is. Uh, the historical context. And I found a great image of a sort of a mysterious figure as I understand it for John Galt. Uh, and uh, the historical context of the novel and the, fil the deeper philosophical issues in it. And it contains a chapter called, it's actually called, Is Atlas Still Shrugging? Um, or Atlas is Still Shrugging, excuse me, it was a statement, not a question. And uh, I look at some of the parallels. Now, when I looked at the parallels, it was things like net neutrality and various reg you know, regulations on business. One of the most interesting parallels actually is the attack on fracking, uh, for, you know, the oil drilling technique because it's so completely, it's literally taken right out of Atlas Shrugged with the, it is the method that uh, Ellis Wyatt says that he's working on. I discovered this new method for extracting oil from shale. Well, this is that new method that he was talking about. But the interesting thing is the attacks on fracking are taken uh, straight out of uh, the attacks on Reardon metal. This idea of, well, maybe could sort of kind of, you know, all these sort of vague possibilities that it could lead to problems with always insinuating it's dangerous without ever actually proving anything. Uh, so a lot of interesting parallels. Now, in talking about the current situation with the coronavirus, the, the main thing I see, now I'll get, I think there are some parallels I'll we'll get to later. The main thing I see is, though, is, is that the thing that's not parallel, and if I could go on about that a little bit, um, it reminds me, you know, I don't think Ayn Rand would have written a pandemic into Atlas Shrugged because it would have kind of muddied some of the issues that she wants to talk about. So an example of this, something I talk about in the book is something that really didn't struck me until I was writing these essays and I, I, I came across it in looking at the historical context of the novel. I think of Atlas Shrugged as a novel of the Cold War era, you know, and, and, and you can see why, because it creates all, it has all these issues that were the big issues of the Cold War. The issue of individualism versus collectivism, of you know, a takeover of global socialism, of going all right around the world versus America as this one last holdout of capitalism and the beleaguered capitalists being attacked. So you can see it as a Cold War era novel, you know, published at the height of the Cold War in 1957. But the thing that struck me and that I hadn't really noticed before is we have the people state 
of England. We have the people state of Mexico. We have the people state of India that's mentioned. The one thing that's missing is there's no people state of Russia in Atlas Shrugged. And there's no Soviet Union in Atlas Shrugged. So socialism, you know, these uh, socialist tyrannies are taking over the entire world. They're all becoming tyrannical people states, but there's no Soviet Union. And that strikes me as very unusual for you know, a novel that's published in 1957 that there would be by Ayn Rand who came from the Soviet Union and for whom opposition to Soviet tyranny in, in foreign policy was a major cause of her life, but there's no Soviet Union in the novel. Now, you can see the reason why she would do that, which is it creates among, it would create some, it would muddy the waters a little bit, creates some unclear issues. So for example, if John Galt and his people are going on a strike mm -hmm. And the strike is supposed to collapse the government of the United States so that they, the producers, can take over or, or can, so they can be free. That gets complicated if there's a Soviet Union, you know, in the 1957 context, there's a Soviet Union hanging out there basically waiting to invade if the, if the government of the United States collapses. So she has to create a situation where, you know, she never really addresses it. She wants it to stay in the background. She wants you not to notice it. But the implication is that all, the, all these people states across the globe are too poor, too weak, to, um, they're, they're in too much of a state of collapse to be any kind of military threat to the United States. And that has to be part of the implied background because then you know, the threat of war or invasion from without would mess up John Galt's plan to withdraw the brains of the world and cause the collapse of the, uh, of the looters regime. Uh, so she, you know, she was a very disciplined writer and she didn't introduce anything. She, she, she made sure that the details of the world and the issues that she brought up and the conflicts that she brought up were all ones that would help to demonstrate the theme that she had in mind that she wanted to uh, uh, that she wanted to put into place uh, by way of her plot. So that's why she wouldn't have put a pandemic in here because a bit like war and the military, a pandemic is one situation where it would be, I think, recognized and uh, accepted by a lot of people that the government can or does have some extraordinary and unusual powers that it wouldn't uh, that it would it would use in this emergency situation that it wouldn't do under normal conditions. So that's why that's the sort of the lack of parallel here between what's going on now is that there is a situation where there is a real threat from a pandemic. Uh, there is and there are real measures that you know gov real powers that legitimate powers that government would have to uh, to prevent that disease from spreading. And we could talk you know go into more political philosophy level, if you like. Um, where I see the parallel actually is that, you know, if, if, if there were a pandemic in Atlas Shrugged or in the universe of Atlas Shrugged, let's say, if there were a pandemic that was going around and there was this horrible threat, what would Dagny Taggart be doing? What would Hank Reardon be doing? What would uh, John Galt be doing? Well, they'd be inventing things, right? They'd be coming up with all of these inventions and, and using science and technology to come to a solution. So we're sort of relying on that to happen here, that somebody's going to come up with a vaccine. Hopefully, since you know it takes a while to get a vaccine, it takes a while to test it to make sure it's safe and effective. We're hoping that a lot sooner than that, people can come up with treatments. They can come up with various ways of, of diminishing the impact uh, of of the virus. Where I think we can talk again later about what it would take to end the shutdowns and and have it have the virus be contained short of a uh, um, short of a, a vaccine. But it's going to involve like you know massive uh, scaling up of testing for the virus, so we can identify who has it and who doesn't, which we have absolutely no clue right now because the government totally messed up that process. Well, this is the sort of problem that our heroes in Atlas Shrugged would be out there solving, and I think that the parallel is the incompetence of the government in even attempting to do those things, at least in the U.S. and and most around most of the world, I think the incompetence of, of the government in even attempting to do those things, and also sometimes the hostility faced by the producers. Um, we've had some of that here in the US with you know, Trump, uh, uh, President Trump invoking the Defense Production Act and basically saying, oh, we have 3M is the bad guys. You know, the people who are making the productive equipment, the masks and all that, they're the bad guys and he's the good guy and he's gonna uh, vilify them. So I see a lot of parallels there in the idea of government being caught flat-footed run by people who are more concerned with the show and the look of things uh, rather than with what actually needs to be done to solve the crisis. So I don't know if, if there's a direct, another direction you want to go or follow-up questions. Uh, we'll go to the Q&A. So that was very interesting. Uh, 
So let's go to Andy and get his first thoughts, and then we'll start going to, to, to our participants for their questions. And based on the question, you can add anything you want that you yeah. haven't mentioned. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Excellent, thanks. All right, well, first of all, here's, uh, this, is, this is Rob's book. Who is John Galt anyway? A Reader's Guide to Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged by Robert Trasinski. I've read it, reviewed it. Good book. You know, I recommend it. I recommend it to people. It's good, good, good companion to Atlas Shrugged. And it's also on Amazon, by the way, along with Andy's book. Yeah, there you go. Amazon's Amazon's a great company. Um, now, now I know Rob's Rob knows a lot more about co contemporary politics than, than I do, so I figured I would just you know leave leave him to answer that part of, of the question. But when, when, when I think of his Atlas Shrugged, you know, I, I think of it, you know, from a, from a, a more philosophic than, you know, you know, epistemological rather than a political perspective. You know, the aspect of the mind going on strike is a fascinating idea, you know? And, um, and it, I mean, in Atlas Shrugged, it's done explicitly and, and overtly. It's, I mean, it, it's covert, obviously, it's, it's hidden, mm -hmm. but it becomes, very overt with broad speech, but <clears throat> but it's a centerpiece of the plot. But if we look at history, I think I think there's a lot of instances of independent thinkers going on strike you know, where they had to go on strike. I, I don't mean in the in the free countries or the semi-free countries. Today you could stand up and you could speak out against you know uh, I was gonna I was gonna say Nancy Trump, but you know uh, you know against Trump or Nancy Pelosi or you know you know whatever. And, you know, what, what's going to happen to me if, if, uh, if you know, if I do that? Gets, I get some angry, you know, re responses on Facebook. Um, but in China, for example, you see what the communist regime did to that, that doctor who was evidently was a very, you know, one very competent physician dealing with the disease and two, a courageous individual who had to know the regime wasn't going to be happy with him speaking up. He wanted, but true to the medical profession, he wanted to save lives. And of course, the, the regime incarcerated him. I mean, he died. I don't know if, they, if the communists killed him or if he died from the disease or if it was some combination, if he died from medical neglect, if the communists just let him die, you know, uh, from the disease. I don't know. But I know that speaking, what was Al Gore like to say about speaking truth to power? Yeah, he might try it sometime. It would be, it would be a good change for him. But you know, you know, when you speak truth to, to power that is despotic or dictatorial power, you, 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 you're taking your life in hands. So I want to just give you one, one example here. This is, um, this, this, is, this is the objective standard, old, old school. When, when was this? Winter 2006, 2007. That's a long time ago. Already. Does anybody remember Rodney Stark's book, The Victory of Reason? Anybody remember that book? It's, it was about... 2005, maybe 2006, about 15 years ago, Stark is this devoutly religious, you know, a Catholic, uh, with PhD, uh, I think, in social sciences from Berkeley, you know, in, in, interesting, wrote this book, The Victory of Reason, and, you know, the theme of it was that the, I can't say this with a straight face, the medieval Catholic Church is responsible for Western commitment to reason, science, you know, and, and capitalism. Now, that, published by Random House, reviewed glowing, the New York Times so-called self-proclaimed public record, hired David Brooks to review it in the New York Times Sunday book review section, and he reviewed it glowingly. I was like, what this stuff is intellectual vomit? How does, how does this even get taken seriously? So anyway, I wrote a, you know, an essay in the Objective Standard, uh, The Tragedy of Theology, how religion caused and extended the dark ages, which is a critique of Rodney Stark's The Victory of Reason, but it goes in much deeper philosophical. Anyway, let's talk about the church's suppression of various heretics in the Middle Ages, you know, including Peter Avalon. Now, let me, let me read this, because this is, this is interesting in light of Atlas Shrugged. Quote, one of Avalon's contemporaries, William of Conses, 1080 to 1154, drew the church's predictable ire by condemning those who attacked philosophy and science on the grounds that heartfelt faith was sufficient. The wayward scholars soon decided that resignation was preferable to excommunication. There's a quote from uh, Will Durant, Story of Civilization, Volume 4, Age, uh, Age of Faith. Uh, quote, William retracted his heresies, abandoned philosophy as an enterprise in which profit was not commensurate with the risk, 
became tutor to Henry Plantagenet of England, and retired from history, unquote. In the terms of Ayn Rand's novel, Atlas Shrugged, William of Kahn says, went on strike, unquote, from, from my essay. Uh, now, I, I mean, Durant is excellent on, you know, on, on, on so many historical matters. The Age of Faith is a great book on the era in which the Western world was dominated by the Catholic Church. And the title of that chapter, we talk about the heretics, was, is, was, was, a, was titled The Adventure of Reason. What a, what a perfect title, right? The Adventure of Reason. Because, you know, these uh, 12th and 13th century uh, European Catholic intellectuals were rediscovering Aristotle. And, you know, the, the, the church's predictable response originally was, you know, was, was hostility. But, you know, think about it. When you're living under some kind of dictatorship, religious or secular, you know, whether it's you know, the, the Jewish authorities in ancient Judea, which was a theocratic state, or the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, or the Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalists, the, the jihadists today, or you know, whether it's the National Socialists or the Communists or some garden variety military dictator, they will kill you, <laughs> you know, for speaking out. You know, and we just saw what happened to that courageous doctor in China. So you've got to wonder how many independent thinkers, how many Howard Rock types or Dagny Taggart types, I mean, if you're a woman in Iran today and you want to speak out on, your, on behalf of your, uh, the, the, the individual rights you know, for women, what's going to happen to you? I mean, you, you, you're going to be arrested, tortured, you know, probably killed. You wonder how many independent thinkers you know, go on strike rather than, you know, I would. You know, Ayn Rand was very clear. She couldn't get out of the Soviet Union. She, she, she recognized the futility of arguing with the secret police. I, th I think Atlas has been shrugging throughout all history, given the, um, you know, given the widespread uh, existence of various types of dictatorships all over the world, going back into, into prehistory, you know, whether it was kings or emperors or tribal chiefs or witch doctors or whatever. I think very often independent minds have had to go on strike, you know, for their own survival. And it's heartbreaking because the, not the one, one for them in terms of their, where ego is, right, in terms of their own personal fulfillment. And two, for us, because, you know, the hardest thing to see are the foregone benefits of a policy. How much more advanced would we be if we didn't, if, if, if so many independent thinkers did not have to go on strike for their, for their sheer survival in the endless array of dictatorships that have proliferated throughout human history? I think Ayn Rand really, you know, really uh, caught something here with the idea of the mind on strike. You know, I may talk to Craig Biddle and write an essay you know, for the objective standard on, on this, how, how Atlas has been shrugging throughout all of history and find some of these examples, like the William of Conscious example of people who went on strike. What did, what did, Durant's a great writer. What did he say? He said, realized that he's retired from philosophy because he realized the risk was not commensurate. You know, the, the, the reward was not commensurate with the risk. Yeah, being burned at the stake was not definitely a nice way of putting it. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's a fascinating idea, the mind on strike. And I think Ayn Rand has really caught by making it explicit and that was shrugged and leads us to, to investigate how many times the mind has had to go on strike throughout, throughout history. So that's the perspective I wanted to, you know, to take on this. Yeah, actually, do you mind if I add something to that? Because um, there's been a very interesting discussion actually about that, that the results of that issue and a great term that somebody came up with that it's called authoritarian blindness. And it's the idea that authoritarian regimes actually have no idea, you know, in, in theory, they have absolute power and, and a surveillance state that tells them everything is going on. But in reality, they actually have absolutely no idea what's going on. And that's part of what happened in China because of this, this case he was talking about, the, uh, the doc doctor who early on came and said, you know, I sounded this warning, we have a, a pandemic, we have this respiratory virus, it's causing all sorts of problems. And he was disciplined. He was told, you have to shut up now and, and you have to apologize and not talk about this. And as a result, and it, the idea was that the local, the little local uh, 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 commissar or whatever, the local governor of Wuhan province, they didn't want anybody upsetting the apple cart, that making them look bad to their superiors. And so that was suppressed. And so you have the situation where you have supposedly an authoritarian state with a surveillance state and it's gathering all this information, but then it also suppresses as rumor mongering, quote unquote rumor mongering, any actual information that would tell them what's happening in their own country. And they end up having this phenomenon referred to as authoritarian blindness, where they, you know, apparently up to a few months before, up to right up until the famine, the great famine of Mao's, uh, Mao Zedong's Great Leap Forward, right up before the great famine hit, he was convinced they had a bumper crop 
of food coming in because all his underlings were telling him, oh, in our province, we're doing great. We've got more food than we know what to do with. Everybody was telling him what he wanted to hear, which is that my policies have succeeded brilliantly and all this, all this stuff is coming in. And, uh, uh, and, and the reality was that you know, production of food was cratering and people were, were about to starve. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting that Ayn Rand, of course, you know, having seen some of that up up close in the, in the Soviet Union, she she puts a little bit of that into into the later chapters of Atlas Shrugged, where you have uh, was it Chick Morrison and his morale conditioners, who were sort of the the propaganda and s partly surveillance wing of, uh, of of this sort of nascent dictatorship that's that's taking power. And they talk about how at a certain point in the plot, they says, we don't know what people are thinking. People aren't telling, you know, they realize that people aren't telling them anything. They're not telling them the truth. They have no idea anymore. What, I think this is mostly after Galt's speech. They have no idea. He says, we, I have no idea what people are thinking out there. They're silent. They're not saying anything. And it was the same phenomenon of everybody's afraid to speak. Uh, everything that's coming up, any information that's coming up from below is being, you know, made to disappear by the lower level functionaries who don't want to get in trouble. And Mr. Thompson is way up here at the top of the pyramid, uh, you know, supposedly with absolute power and actually have no idea what's going on and, and no ability to, 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 to change or improve anything or make anything better. Thanks to both speakers. So let's go now to the audience question. And the first question is by Liam. Uh, Liam, I'm unmuting you. So the floor is yours. Yeah, really interesting discussion. I, I might just start with the last point about um, uh, sort of institutional blindness, because um, I was going to make a couple of wider points about, I suppose, almost asking um, a question uh, that might come across as overly optimistic, um, which is that when we get sort of through all of this and we do the post-mortem, are there going to be lessons learned that might, um, you know, have a sort of positive, inf you know, impact on the relationship that we have in our society. I'm looking mostly at the sort of UK and mm -hmm. you know, Western and North American, you know, mixed economies um, in terms of the relationship between the state and the market. Because I think there's always been, you know, for a long time, been this undercurrent of a, you know, suspicion in the market that you know, the state has to intervene. Obviously, the financial crisis um, didn't do us any favours, although we can debate whether that was an instance of market failure or, or regulatory failure. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think the, the example about blindness is it's worse than blindness, is that when you abandon the market and the price signal, and, you know, we've had this you know, very well articulated right back to Adam Smith and in particular by Hayek, the importance of the price signal and faith in prices and pr prices and profits and the profit motive. Um, that, um, you know, I think it was Jean-Paul Sartre who said, you know, the worst thing you can do is, is to not know, um, you know, to, to ignore in French, which is not to ignore, but to not know, to not have the information. Um, but actually, it's worse than that. Um, if you remember the start of the uh, the film, The Big Short, they quote, they they roll out the Mark Twain quote of, um, you know, it's not that you, what you don't know that gets you into trouble; it's what you know for sure, but just ain't so. And that, and I think this, the government reaction to this pandemic, at least what we're seeing in the UK, is a great example of that. And I'm really glad you mentioned the Great Leap Forward famine because that was a great example of what happens. Not only when you abandon the price signal, but you replace it with something that gives you entirely the wrong answer. It kind of doubles down. I don't know if any of you watched the Chernobyl series on Sky, but there's the lovely moment where, you know, the, the people in charge of the nuclear reactor are saying, well, what's the Geiger counter reading? And, and you know, the guy says very sheepishly, well, it's three. Um, I don't know what the units are. And, 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 and they say, they, they sort of say, but it, yeah, but it, you know, it, it only goes up to three. <laughs> and then they say, <laughs> yeah, but it still could just be three. <laughs> Whereas in fact, it's, you know, the radiation is like three billion instead of three. And so um, I think we've seen some amazingly stark examples of regulatory failure here, of the government 
abandoning uh, faith in the market, abandoning faith in the ability of private sector to, to invent and develop tests at scale. We've got talk, people are talking about, you know, I'm, I'm, someone mentioned Amazon. Amazon is, is, is a utility now, apparently. They're so good, they've innovated so much, we now can't do without them. I mean, what would lockdown be like without Amazon? And by the way, you would never have got a car note. You'd never have got text, Tesco, home delivery, if it hadn't been Amazon, you know, um, far finding there. So I think people actually, I think hopefully are going to come out of this with a feeling of actually we made some huge errors, not just not listening to the market, but, but willfully and blindly ignoring it and, and going in exactly the wrong path, whether it's testing, whether it's, um, you know, vaccines, you know, the, the, the fact that we've got people quibbling about the idea that the US administration is pay, paying, you know, six times the normal price for some face masks, when we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars of hits to the economy, you know, if we don't get out of this lockdown very, very quickly. I think it just illustrates how bad government is at the taking decisions. And, you know, guess who the costs fall on? It falls on all of our shoulders. So I've got maybe a little misplaced, but I've got a little bit of optimism that this dialogue that we have in our society about the faith that we can put in mind about the role of profit, such a badly taught, badly understood concept in our society. People think profit is cream on top, whereas actually it is a cost and it is a cost of innovation and risk-taking. And, and I'm hoping that having had our noses rubbed in how bad the government can be and how pronounced regulatory failure can be because of this blindness and this double whammy of heading in completely the wrong direction, that we are, we are going to hopefully come out with a, 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 be a little more enlightened about our faith in markets and innovation and, and free market thinking and action. And I don't know whether I'm being hopefully, hopelessly optimistic, but I'd be very interested in, in people's views on that. Sorry, that was quite a long observation. Robert. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think there's a lot of great things you said there. Unfortunately, you know, as someone who's covered politics for a living for about 25 years now, you are hopelessly over optimistic about lessons being learned. Um, uh, lessons, and you know, even, even I can think of a few rare times where lessons are learned and then they tend to be forgotten after a few years. Uh, but I do think you have a great point that there are many lessons that should be learned and could be learned and that you know, people like people who are in my position to write about this and well, can keep hammering on. And absolutely, the, the issue of blindness, I think is really important because we got into this I think both the U.S. and the Britain got and Britain got into this because we were blind, and it was because of the failure. You know, it was partly because you know the we were blind because the Chinese were blind, and they made the rest of the world blind. They lied and and you know were not forthcoming about what exactly was happening. Partly because they themselves, you know, had prevented themselves from knowing what was happening, as we just talked about. So we came in without good information from China. But then we were blind to it because of the complete failure of testing. Now, I gather there's a similar story in the UK to what happened in the US. I'm more familiar with the US end of, end of it. And that was that uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, which is our main sort of medical pandemic bureaucracy uh, in, in the US, basically decided we're going to have a centralized, nationalized testing wow. regime. And I we're going to produce the test and we're going to, we're going to process, you're going to, when you take the tests, you're going to send them off to us and we're going to process them. And that's the only testing that we're going to allow. And the FDA basically said, no, no other testing can be allowed. And some of that was done on purpose as a, this sort of bureaucratic centralization. Some of it I understand was done by accident, that there was like a, an emergency declaration that was made that was supposed to make it easier to respond. But then once that kicked in, there was this weird quirk where under the emergency regime, it was actually harder to produce tests. Uh, there was more bureaucracy around producing the tests. So the result was that CDC was, was, the, was centralized, it was nationalized, it was the only thing doing testing, and they messed it up. They, they produced a test that didn't work, that was very difficult to use, that was not able to be used at the scale or with the speed that was actually required. And we ended up being totally blind as to what was going on, 
whereas in South Korea, which is now when I criticize people that we, they did a bad job of testing, pretty much everybody did a bad job of testing. You know, the number of countries that have done a good job with coronavirus can be listed on, on, on one hand optimistically. So South, you know, it's, it's less that uh, everybody else messed up, but South Korea got things right. And one of the things they got right is they brought in very early on, they brought in all of their, you know, the, the all, all the big pharmaceutical and, and biotech firms there and said, we need testing, start developing tests. And they managed to ramp up a very high degree of testing very early on, which gave them the ability to know what was going on. And the, the thing, you know, we, we could talk about the lockdowns and all of that, but the lockdowns are the blunt instrument the government is using because they because it's blind, because they don't know who has this virus and who doesn't. So to go into the, you know, I've done some interesting interviews with a fellow named uh, Amesh Adalja, uh, an objectivist who also happens to be a, a highly regarded expert on infectious diseases. And you know, he said, we've been waiting for a pandemic like this. We thought it was going to happen for a long time. And the funny thing is they, you, know, you had a whole bunch of people like him preparing on this, working on it. They still weren't prepared because of this, this uh, bureaucracy. But you know, he, he basically points out that the uh, the classic way to deal with a pandemic is test and trace, which is that you you test, you have a test, you have a way of telling who has the disease. And then when somebody has it, you say, oh, you, you, you the, this individual person over here, you go into quarantine for two weeks. And after two weeks, we know you're not infectious anymore. You're not contagious. You can't spread this. And that's how we stop it. We identify specific people. And then the tracing is you spread specific people and people that they've been in contact with. So you have you know, this one person, and then you had conversations with five other people. You identify those people. You say to those specific people, you have to stay in for a specific period of time, you know, however long it takes, usually in an order of a couple of weeks, for the virus to no longer be produced in your system and be contagious. And then, and then uh, after that, you can go out and about your business, and that's how you stop the thing from spreading. Now, because that information was not there, because it was impossible to get that information, you have to do this blunt instrument of saying, well, everybody has to stay indoors, not just the specific people we've identified, but absolutely everybody, because we have no idea who has it and who doesn't. And then they have to stay inside for six weeks, two months, two and a half months, this indefinite period of time, because you, know, you can't just, because it's everybody, because you don't know, you have no information at all. You have to wait till this sort of works its way through and and uh, if everybody's been sitting at home for two months, then we get over the curve and it starts going down. And the biggest concern I have right now is that we've got the same bureaucracy, the same blindness that's being prepared for the next round of this. Because what happens is now here in Virginia, we're projected to be mostly over it by, by early June. So in early June, you're going to get down to the point where in our state, at least uh, in the great Commonwealth of Virginia, there, there will be like two or three, you know, a, a dozen, couple dozen cases and two or three people dying. It's going to be a, a much less, a much smaller problem. And the idea is you, okay, you could open everything up, but then if you open everything up, you go back to having the same problem uh, of the, the infection could come back, it could, could spread again, and you have to lock everything down again, you know, maybe in the fall, maybe earlier. And all of that's going to depend on the idea of we have to have a regime of testing and tracing. You get it down to a small number of cases, you can test for it, you can quarantine only the specific people who have it for only a short, relatively short period of time and not disrupt and shut down the entire economy. But from what I can tell, there's very little being done. Uh, you know, Donald Trump basically just came up with this plan for reopening. And the plan for reopening is I'll let the states decide when they reopen which he doesn't have a choice in anyway, because in our system, that's where the power actually resides. But then he says, and I'm going to leave the testing up to them. So the number one thing you'd have to do to be able to safely reopen and prevent this from being a problem again in six months or, or sooner, he's basically given up on doing anything about. And that is the interesting thing about it, that the, this, this blindness in government, this incompetence in government. And I think that is should be one of the major uh, lessons. You know, this is a... Um, it's not just uh, it's not just a blindness in 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 terms of you know how do we what's our strategy in relation to mm -hmm. testing. Uh, I, I think if you go upstream in this, it's mm -hmm. a blindness at the point of whether or not we could have got more of a heads up from China. I, I think that's a little bit yeah. of a red herring. It's a blindness in terms of where does the best um, solution lie here. 
does it lie in us throwing this problem out to the private sector and, and oh, yeah. having faith in these great pharmaceutical companies, which it sounds like South, South Korea did, in the knowledge that actually their incentives are incredibly aligned here because, you know, companies like Roche and Pfizer, the last thing they want to do is come up with a dud test, right? And, and, and the government, our government turned their back on all of that expertise. And what did they do? They put their faith in their own procurement expertise, which ended up with them buying three and a half million tests from China. But it turns out are, are, are duds. <laughs> How on earth do we, did we get mm -hmm. to that situation? I think it's deeply troubling. And I think I will retain a little bit more optimism that the great British public must, must learn some lessons. Wrong. Right, and, but on talking about lessons learned, though, you know what I've noticed. Um, I haven't follow. I haven't followed the British situation or British politics as closely as American politics. But um, I, Boris Johnson, when he counted out the hospital uh, after after every coronavirus, he basically delivered this love letter to the NHS. Yeah, uh, and yeah. you know it shows me that, that, that we may not be. You know, I, I like Boris. I want to like Boris. I, he's um, there's a video going around that made me fall in love with him because I, I, I used to read his columns in the Telegraph years and years ago. Um, and you know, he's, a, he's a funny and interesting writer. And uh, I saw a great video of him talking about uh, this interview he did where they talk about uh, you know, what do you do when you're, you're in a crisis and things are difficult? How do you sustain your spirits? And he says, oh, well, I think of the great poetry I know, like the Iliad, and then recites like the first 27 or first 40 lines of the Iliad in Greek. <laughs> And well, look, if we, um, I don't want to hog the floor, but if we've got time later, one of my other questions is, what is the fallout here in terms of our relationship with the NHS? Because, yeah, he famously stood up and said the NHS is, is powered by love. And I, I remember thinking, yeah, it, 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 it might be powered by love, but it isn't powered by money. Um, but anyway, perhaps we, can, perhaps we can come back to that. Mm -hmm. Just a small comment on Liam's point on optimism. So if we see what Greece did with the crisis 10 years ago and how the financial crisis and how Greece deals with the COVID crisis. So supposedly at the moment we have the most liberal government ever in Greece. And they, they now have a completely controlled economy. So not only they didn't learn any lesson from the previous crisis, they are dealing with this crisis in a more statist way than the radical left dealt with the previous crisis. And you can say it's not the same, the one is an economic crisis, but the fact that they cannot even understand what you said, like the signal of crisis. So basically one of the first things they did, they put a, they put a price control. And Greece was, you couldn't find antiseptics anywhere. And only two weeks ago, someone managed to produce some antiseptics and the Minister of Development, who is supposedly the most free marketeer, tweeted, we now have an antiseptic which is like this weird stuff where this Soviet commissar says, oh, this month, uh, you know, the production of ham went up uh, 5%. Anyway, Andy. Well, you know, I don't have anything, I don't have anything to share on, on that situation. If I comment, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the topic. So may, maybe you uh, just wanna, you know, move on with the contemporary politics discussion. Right, okay. So let's go to the next question then, which is, in the, by the way, <laughs> Angela mentioned, uh, the NHS is powered by 12% tax on a day. Very good point. Okay. So one of our friends in- no, no, no. <laughs> One of our friends in the comment asks, what do you think of the roles that scientists play in this current situation? Do you have comments on the way different governments are working with scientists? And if, if I can add one question here, I really don't understand how the, the Stanford scientists, like Dr. Ioannidis, why they're not everywhere on the media. Like they are doing research, which is more important than anyone's research, and they're nowhere to be seen, at least in the, in the mainstream narrative. Anyway, uh, Robert or Andy, who wants to jump in? The question is the role, the, the relationship between the role of the science and the, re and the way different governments are working with science. Let Robert jump in. Well, I, I guess uh, I, I can't comment too much about the way different governments are dealing with scientists because I haven't, uh, you know, sort of reviewed the situation. 
Uh, I had no idea what's going on in Greece, by the way. Uh, so, so that's new information to me. Oh, by the way, on that, I want to mention one thing that uh, happened in the U.S. is similar to that, but I'm talking about hand sanitizer. Uh, one of the things we had in the U.S. is that uh, the the market for uh, distilled beverages, for basically for alcoholic drinks, whiskey, and that sort of thing, the market has crashed because all the bars are closed and all the restaurants are closed. That's a huge mar part of their market. So a bunch of U.S. distilleries said, look, we make alcohol. What's the main ingredient of hand sanitizer? It's alcohol. So they switched it. We, just, we can switch over and make bucket loads. You know, we can make this by the thousands of gallons. And then they had to do all these regulatory hurdles to try to, to, try to produce that. Uh, it, whereas, you know, the one positive thing that's come out actually has been there have been a number of cases uh, in the U.S., a number of ways in the U.S. in which regulations that should never have existed in the first place have been suspended or drawn back. Uh, so, for example, one of them was licensing of doctors. So we have a situation where if you're licensed to be a doctor in Virginia, you're not necessarily allowed to practice as a doctor in New York. Well, what happens if there's a pandemic in New York, if you know, the hot spots hitting in New York, they need a lot more physicians there. Uh, you can't just pick up from Virginia and go work in New York. Well, they, they suspended, you know, temporarily suspended those regulations, but it's leading a lot of people, hopefully, if we talk about lessons learned and we want to be optimistic, hopefully leading a lot of people to say, okay, great, you know, maybe we should get rid of these regulations permanently. Um, so there are a number of cases that have been like that, and I think that's a hopeful sign. Now, as to how we're dealing with scientists, you know, the interesting thing is there's been this, in the U.S. at least, there's been this weird dance going on uh, between the sort of medical experts in our government and the president of the United States, who is, as you can imagine, not a man with a scientific temperament. Uh, and so there's been this whole attempt of how do you get Donald Trump to even pay attention to what the scientists are saying. And I think that what we've seen in the press conferences is the main, the main thing they figured out is you have to flatter him obsequiously uh, in public, and then he'll listen to you in private. Um, but I've also seen a lot of, uh, you know, you're talking about different experts talking about this uh, and the Stanford guys. There has been, at least on the American right, I think, a certain kind of an interest in saying, in rejecting the knowledge of the scientific experts on this. So, and sometimes they'll say, oh, we should listen to this, this guy over here. It's their expert shopping, which is the idea of, you know, I agree in listening to all the experts who agree with the conclusion I want to hear, right? That's expert shopping. You know, go around and find the one guy with a PhD after his name uh, or, you know, a university position or, or some kind of credential uh, who, will, who will assure you, oh, no, 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 this is, this is no big deal. This, this is really no worse than the flu. Um, so there's been, it's sort of, I think, unfortunate aspect, and I don't know to, to what extent this has happened in the UK, but it's an unfortunate aspect in the US that coronavirus has become a political football, as if, as if it cares about, you know, what your political loyalties are. But because Donald Trump early on said, oh, this is no big deal, it's all under control, it's not that bad, there was a certain group on the right that had an interest in saying, you know, we, we need to validate this. So let's go with whatever evidence we can find or whatever argument we could make to say that you know, Rush Limbaugh said, this is just the common cold. It's, it's just an ordinary flu. It's no, actually no worse, even as the evidence began to mount that this is something bigger. Uh, and so to, to sort of put the politics of it ahead of the science of it and to have this sort of, I see a sort of emotionally driven reasoning in some cases. Uh, uh, I've made the mistake of going on Facebook a couple of times and Facebook is sort of conspiracy theory central. I've discovered it's like the, it's a, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the, uh, you know, this, this talk about maybe this escaped from a lab in China. This is, this is the bio, bioweapons lab that uh, uh, conspiracy theories escape from. Uh, and so you have a lot of people sort of coming up with crazy theories about what the origin of the virus is or how it's all being invented by the experts. And, a lot of it comes down to the fact of people not wanting to take the effort to, uh, to understand and painstakingly go over and objectively go over without having a predetermined conclusion that they want to reach, objectively go over uh, the evidence about what is the danger of this virus, how do you deal with it, uh, what's the best way uh, to, to come up with uh, a solution. Uh, and so I think that we do have a problem with people's ability to deal with science and scientists, because I think, you know, the, to get back to it, I think the, the fundamentally you have, there's an anti-intellectual culture and a, uh, 
a culture in which science is not well understood really on either side of the debate, it, it tends to get used as a political mascot or, or a political football. So you, you have, I did a piece uh, uh, in the Bulwark where the Bulwark is a American public, uh, political publication that I, I, a lot of my stuff is published in now. I did a piece a year or so ago called Why I Don't Believe in Science. And this is in response to one of the, I think it's Andrew Yang, one of the presidential, one of the you know 472 Democratic Party presidential candidates who had said, you know, I, uh, global warming is one of his causes because I believe in science. And where, you know, if you actually asked, I'm sure if you actually asked him about the science of global warming and, and why, um, you know, why he believes in it and, and what are the issues and what, what, do, what does a tropospheric lapse rate mean, you know, and any of the technical aspects of the science of global warming, he, he probably wouldn't have a clue. But I believe in science be, be basically means that when I think science stands for the political conclusions I'd like, then I'm in favor of it. So science becomes very much the handmaiden of politics here in America. Uh, and it probably something is similar happening in, in the UK. And it's, it's been done by the left. And now I think with coronavirus, to some extent, it's being done by the right, that there are people who have this interest in saying, in, in downplaying the coronavirus as a way of supporting whatever political position they want, whether it's the purely partisan one of um, supporting Donald Trump, or whether it's the idea that, well, I'm, I'm against all the lockdowns. And rather than arguing for it on the basis of actual science, arguing for it on the basis of saying, well, I think this whole thing's overblown by those so-called experts. And so I think we have, a, we have a, uh, an issue with, with basically reason being the handmaiden of political tribalism uh, rather than uh, uh, having a rational method for dealing with these things. Thank you. Andy. I want to go back to, um, you know, to, the, to the issue I, I raised before, and that is about freedom of the mind. Uh, and, and how rare it is in the world today and, and in history. I, I, I mean, that's, we're talking about Atlas Shrugged here, and I mean, that, that's, that's part of Ayn Rand's theme, right? One, in two, in two parts, there's the epistemological part and there's the political part, right? That um, one, the, the mind is mankind's survival instrument, and two, as a social condition, the mind requires individual rights and political economic liberty to, to, to fully flourish. Look at China as an example. I mean, what's the population in China? That was like one and a half billion, something like that. And we, we could see you know, the, the, the well-known so-called phenomenon of the overseas Chinese. You know, that is when, when a, lot of, a lot of Chinese escape from China, whether it was a communist state or whether it was controlled by the Japanese, you know, uh, military dictatorship or whether it was controlled by some brutal emperor or, or whatever. The phenomenon of the overseas Chinese is when, you know, when a, lot of, a lot of Chinese individuals reach freedom, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the United States, uh, whatever, you see the, the flourishing of, you know, of, of the uh, Chinese individuals get, you know, the, 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 the cultural emphasis on, on education and, and on, on entrepreneurship and, and on practicality. So you wonder, you know, all this brain power in China, all this talent, all this in, in intelligence suppressed by one of the most brutal uh, regimes of history. Uh, the contemporary regime is not as, as brutal as Mao, but that's really damning somebody with faint praise. I mean, Mao is, prob is probably the number one uh, mass murderer in, in all of history. You know, you know, Rudolf Rommel updated, you know, in uh, 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 what was the, the what was, what's the name of that book? The, was, I, I forget the name of, of, of Rummel's book off, offhand, but it'll, 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 it'll come to me. But, you know, he's an American political scientist and, and he, and, and he uh, coined the term democide, you know, the, 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 mur the, the, the murder of, of, the, of the people by the government. And, you know, Rummel's, uh, Rummel's uh, late, latest statistics regarding, I mean, he passed away a few years ago, but his latest estimate, you know, of the Chinese communist regime, oh, Death by Government, that's the name of Rummel's book that I was thinking. What a, what a great title, isn't it? I mean, death, death by government. It's not funny, but I mean, how appropriate for, you know, for so many of these regimes historically. 70 million. We're talking probably 70 million deliberately, innocent civilians deliberately murdered by, by Mao's regime. Uh, you remember, you, you remember uh, Tiananmen, after Tiananmen Square, the, the, the outrage and, uh, around the world, and uh, Deng Xiaoping said, 3,000 people. 
He said, we, you know, what's, this, what's the uproar about? We've murdered millions, or we killed millions on the mound. Nobody had, nobody had a peak. Now with 3,000 people, and you know, people are going to make this big fuss about it. Um, so I just wonder, you know, again, about the foregone benefits. How many vaccines would we have? How many more advances would we make in medicine and any other field imaginable if, 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 if we could... Uh, you know, now this is now talk about being overly optimistic. I mean, I'm but I'm allowed to daydream, right? That we, you know, Atlas Shrugged is uh, translated into virtually every language around the world. Educated people read English anyway; they can read Atlas in the original. If we could promote Ayn Rand's ideas around the world and and eventually lead to the real those two realizations that the mind is mankind's tool of survival, the mind requires individual rights political, economic liberty, and we can gradually bring down these dictatorships and liberate the human mind. Freedom is basically freedom of the mind. If seven billion, seven and a half billion uh, people, uh, those who choose to think mankind's best, those who choose to think free to do so. I mean, this is a point also made subsequently by uh, Julian Simon, right, uh, the, the American economist, in his book, The Ultimate Resource, that the ultimate resource is not coal or iron or oil or fertile lands. It's this. It's human intelligence. And, you know, he uh, didn't explain it philosophically. He was an economist the way Ayn Rand did, but still, you know, so the one last point I want to make on this is, um, you know, one of my favorite heroes that nobody knows anything about, and that's Maurice Hillman. You know, the, uh, the American vaccinologist at Merck, died in 2005. Even me, his lifelong hero worship, I didn't hear of Hillman and it's spelled with an E, H-I-L-L-E-N-A-N. I didn't hear Maurice Hillman until he died, and I just happened to saw the obituary. Believe me, I'm not in the habit of reading obituary. And, you know, Robert Gallo, another great scientist who was one who discovered the, uh, the, the HIV, you know, eulogized Hillman, but Hill, Hillman and his team at Merck developed eight of the 14 vaccines routinely administered in our day, the vaccines for measles, mumps, uh, hepatitis A, hepatitis B. I mean, this guy's a real hero uh, of medicine. And interestingly, he drove his team mercilessly. He was like a really tough guy to work for. It reminded me of Steve Jobs, you know, uh, in, in, in that way. But they, they stayed and worked with him, just like a lot of, a lot of Steve Jobs people stayed at Apple and, 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 and worked with him because, I mean, one, I guess they're getting paid well, but two, they knew this guy was this guy was masterful at what he did, and they could achieve their best and great things under Hillman, you know, or, or under Jobs. Uh, all these vaccines, uh, Gallo, another great scientist, eulogized Hillman uh, by saying that his work saved more human lives than that of any other scientist in the 20th century. And how's that? The eulogy. You know, obviously, we need that today. And we are, and again, I, I, this may be an opportunity, you know, here. Uh, <clears throat> this may be an opportunity for us, as this gentleman was saying before, I don't know, I don't remember your first name. Liam. Yeah, Liam, you know, may, may, Liam, we may be, the two of us may be overly optimistic. Robert, I think Robert's probably realistic on this. But we could dream, can't we? That, that we could use this as an opportunity to reach out to our brothers and sisters and say, you want to be, let's, here's the question in this context. How can we be more prepared for epidemics, pandemics, viruses, and every other goddamn thing? You know, how can we be more prepared uh, than we currently are? And, and one thing we, we, you know, we need in the United States is we need to dismantle the FDA. We need to dismantle the, the regulations on, uh, on, you know, on the pharmaceutical and uh, uh, biotech industries. We need to respect the rights of, of doctors, the MDs, who, who read the journals, they realize all oh, these new medications are, you know, are, in, uh, uh, are being introduced. We haven't had 12 years of testing, but there's some testing done. There's promise here. I tell my patients, tell them the risks, and then the respect of the patient who's an adult, his or her right to choose to use the drug and the doctor's right uh, to prescribe it, you know, it's in such cases. And, and uh, we, we need freedom in the medical marketplace. One that'll, that'll, uh, you know, free up the Maurice Hillmans of the world to, to develop such vaccines, start their own companies, be entrepreneurial, and sell it and make a profit and not, you know, and not be ostracized because, oh, they're making money, you know, uh, you know, oh, you know uh, with this vaccine. You know, is that you, we realize, wait a minute, 
he saved my life and I gave him, you know, $500 or, or $5,000. Know, or some medical charity paid for me your $5,000. Who, who got the bargain here? Well, you know, that, that's, a, you know, that's, a, yeah, that's a tough question. That's a tough question to answer, right? To, to celebrate the guy who saved my life in exchange for $1,000. He's a hero. You know, this is how we, you know, uh, this is how we promote uh, the, the Maurice Hillmans of the world. This is, you know, this is how we, we develop vaccines. And this is how we, we're, we're much better prepared for, uh, uh, you know, for these kind of pandemics. One, one last point that's before I, I, you know, turn this back to you guys, is uh, was a baby aspirin. The, the, the FDA, you know, the, uh, medical doctors in the United States knew for a long time that baby aspirin might, might help uh, prevent heart attacks or might help prevent uh, uh, second heart attacks, uh, and they prescribed, and with doctors who prescribed it for their patients, but the FDA they wanted years and years and years of testing and refused to allow Bayer, you know, and other aspirin manufacturers to advertise this. And we don't know, we don't know how much blood the FDA has on their hands because there's how many people died of heart attacks whose lives might have been, there's no way to know. You know, again, the foregone benefits of a policy are the, are the most difficult to project. We don't know how many people died uh, preventable deaths, you know, from heart disease that could have been saved because of, uh, of, of the FDA's uh, re refusing to allow uh, the aspirin manufacturers to advertise. That needs to stop. And I think it is an opportunity, like Liam said before, it is an opportunity to reach out to people for the need, not just for a free market, but for freedom of the mind. If Ayn Rand's theme and that was short, then this is an opportunity. And we need, you know, we, we need to take, was it a, was it Saul Alinsky who said, never let a, a crisis go to waste? Or, or, or some, some, some communist said it. It might have been Saul Alinsky. I don't know. But <laughs> this is a crisis and we have the answer in the future to how to resolve this. And we need to, we need to speak out in every form open to us, public and private. Please read, right? Let's go to Joseph. Joseph, you're unmuted. By the way, when someone asks question and the question is answered, unmute them again. So if you want to come back, just raise your hand so I know and I unmute you again. Joseph. Yeah. Uh, so most heroes in Atlas Shrugged have a philosophical change before they shrug. What role does philosophy have in getting people to shrug? And can it happen that you get a large movement of people shrugging? without a philosophical change? Okay, it, uh, I think I'll take a first pass of that. I'm not sure I fully understand the question in terms of, are you actually looking for, whether you're actually looking for people to shrug in terms of like quit their jobs and go on strike, which I don't think is what we're looking for in the current situation, but more that reaching that point of being willing to change their outlook on things and being willing to stop supporting. You know, one of the things I, I write about in my book is that, uh, uh, the, I, the one of the most interesting things actually that I, I, I did while working on the book was I did a comparison of uh, of Atlas Shrugged and Galt's speech to a, a essay called The Power of the Powerless, this famous essay written by Václav Havel in 1978, I think it was, uh, in which he talked about what to do about the, you know, pro, the what, what the dissidents should do about the Soviet Union and it's basically the, the thing that laid the, the framework for the dissident movement that actually did bring down the Soviet Union roughly 12, 10 or 12 years later. And uh, the interesting parallel is this idea of, he basically came up with something very similar to the idea of shrugging. You know, his idea wasn't so much you go off into a valley and, you know, and disappear and, and uh, stop working, but more the idea of shrugging philosophically, shrugging mentally, uh, throwing off the shackles of conformity to this ideology that's being relentlessly pushed pushed in on you by the state. And that he talked about forming these sort of separate communities where you live within the truth. And by living within the truth, he means you're rejecting the sort of the, the, the conformist lies that are required of you to cooperate with and work with and, and, and to be sort of a self-enforcer of the regime. And seeing things independently through your own eyes. And that's sort of what I see as what shrugging means in the deeper sense, right? So it doesn't mean you quit your job and you go to a valley in, in, in Colorado. Uh, it, it, mean, you know, it may mean quitting a job depending on the situation you're in. But what more important thing is it, it means the idea of sort of throwing off the need to conform to a certain ideology that keeps the system as it is working and in place. You know, because a, a lot, you know, we don't, we don't live in a police state. 
uh, in, in the West here. And even Havel talks about how even in his situation, you know, he was writing in this sort of post, um, this post-Stalinist era where it wasn't that people shipped off to the gulags and mass numbers. They were simply being, it, 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 the whole the communist system in Eastern Europe relied to a large extent on ideological indoctrination and on this pressure of conformity. So he famously uses the example of a grocer, you know, puts it as, as a placard in his window that says, workers of the world unite. Right? He says, does the grocer actually care about whether the workers of the world are going to unite? Uh, does he actually know what that means? Does he, is he actually expressing his passionate devotion to the unity of the workers of the world? No, he doesn't do it. The real meaning of that placard is, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm afraid and I don't want any trouble. So I'm going along with what you know, they told me, they gave this to me and told me to put it in my window, so I'm putting it in the window. And a lot of the politics of, uh, uh, a lot of the, the politics of big government, the politics of statism here in the West, you know, we don't have dictatorship, we don't have, cen we don't have censorship. Like Andy said, you know, he, uh, people will be mean to you on Twitter. Uh, they're mean to Andy on Facebook, they're mean to me on Twitter. Um, People will be mean to you on Twitter and call you names, and that's about the extent of it. But it's that conformity and the fear of causing trouble if you come out and say something that is not the approved thing for people to say. And that's sort of the mental shackles that people have to throw off. I, I think it can happen. It, in, I think crisis situations can cause that, to, or I don't say they cause it to happen. What causes it to happen is the choice of the individual but they can precipitate it in some ways where you have almost like, and I've seen it happen fairly rarely, but it does happen where you have almost a, a tipping point, a, a critical mass is reached where everybody says, you know what, that was a bad idea. We don't, you don't, you don't say that, it, that's not something we're gonna be saying anymore. I mean, there, and the number of cases of this are, are unfortunately, I have to say, this is, I, I'm famously optimistic about the state of the world, but I'm also the one who's pessimistic about tends to be pessimistic about the hope that, you know, this next political cycle, something amazing is going to happen and everybody's going to, uh, my, the last time I was really super optimistic that way was after September 11th. I thought, well, now everybody will really understand the threat of Islamic terrorism. They'll really stand up to Iran and they'll do this and they'll do that. And a lot of stuff did happen. A lot of things that I, you know, some things I didn't like, some things I did approve of. There was a great deal of energy and a lot of things were done for about five years. And then it ran into trouble and people didn't like George W. Bush and the, uh, the, the philosophical confusion came up and the poor implementation and all sorts of, there's a whole mass of excuses build up. And now, you know, after about 10 years or so, after September 11th, it, the number of lessons you can really say people learned is actually very, 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 very small, the number that they maintained. And so, like I said, it's very rare that you have that sort of critical mass that's reached. I mean, the, the one unambiguous example I can think of in sort of living memory uh, is in the U.S. is segregation, right? So you had, you know, a point where uh, slightly before I was born, which I guess is not that, not that recent, but uh, slightly before I was born, you could find, you know, people who were willing to stridently, actually the year before I was born, there was a guy who ran for president by saying segregation now, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, 1968, George Wallace. Uh, and got all sorts of votes. So there was a, you know, there was a time when you could come out and, and for this unjust system that has no rational foundation, you could come out and stridently advocate for it and find a mass audience. You know, you do that today and you're basically going to be black, uh, you're going to be blacklisted and thrown out of polite society. So there are times when you have a an irrational and destructive idea and an irrational and destructive political system that you reach critical mass and everybody just turns against it and it gets thrown out and over a period of a decade or so it gets thrown out completely but it's a pretty rare thing to have happen and i think that uh a lot of work so you know i think every uh, so instead of the don't let a crisis go to waste i think that was alinsky by the way i think you're right although the most recent person to say it was, I think, Rahm Emanuel in the Clinton administration. Uh, same, sorry, in the uh, same city, same mentality, right? Exactly. Uh, a lot of them had connections to Alinsky. Um, but uh, the, the, the other one I like is the whole thing about, uh, in Chinese, the word for crisis means danger and opportunity. Now, it turns out, I did a little research, it turns out that's not actually true. It's one of those things that sort of gets 
it, it worked its way into popular culture somewhere. And if, you know, people who actually study Chinese say, no, that's not what it means. That's the, the symbol. It, it, it was mistranslated, but I want, it's too, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, on, on Twitter, we say it's too good to check it, it, it. It's not true, but it ought to be true because it's a great idea that, you know, every time you have a crisis, it is a danger that, you know, things go horribly wrong. It's also an opportunity. And in this case, I, like Andy said, I, I see huge numbers of opportunities to go ahead and, and hammer away at this. Um, early on in the crisis here in the US, there's somebody who wrote an article said, there are no libertarians in a pandemic. And now by libertarian, he meant advocates of small government, advocates of free markets. You know, the idea is this pandemic shows how much we rely on big government to save us from everything. And uh, uh, it's, it's exa exactly the argument I expected people to make. But the amazing thing about it is, how terrible an argument that is, how little it comports to the reality of, you know, here's a, a crisis brought to us by communist China, which is trying to sort of, you know, they're trying to get the band back together of the Maoist uh, cult of personality now under Xi Jinping and, uh, you know, brought to us by FDA regulations and CDC centralization and, you know, this whole uh, a litany of things and uh, that uh, litany of state government interventions that caused this problem. And if you look around the world right now, it, you're a whole lot worse off being an authoritarian in a, in a pandemic. Because, you know, China, I think, just revised up, finally revised upward the number of deaths they've been claiming for a while. We had 20,000 deaths, 25,000 deaths in total. They now revised it upward by 50%. They're probably still lying, and it's probably more. Uh, Russia, apparent, supposedly, according to the official statistics, has uh, a very, very small number of deaths from coronavirus, but the stories we're get coming out from Russia indicate they're, they're doing another Chernobyl, right, where they pretend everything's fine and is actually a disaster underneath. Um, Iran is another case where it, it, it got out of control, uh, in part because you have a, not just a dictatorship, but a theocratic dictatorship, which is not very big on, on scientific accuracy and truth, uh, and where they're also lying about it. So you're seeing cases where authoritarianism and you know, total government control from free society, a relatively free society like America to a dictatorship like China or, or Iran makes this so much worse. And there's a lot of good information out there about that. And that's something that we have the opportunity to sort of make that case that, that the top down command and control uh, dictatorial authoritarian approach to the economy and to science uh, does not, you know, produces disastrous results. It kills people. Thank you. I agree with, with everything Robert just said. I just want to add, you know, and the, uh, the vaccines or the cures, you know, for, for this ailment or any others will, will come from the, the private sector, from the pharmaceutical companies, from biotech companies, uh, and the freer they are uh, to, to research and develop and to, uh, make, and to make a profit, then the you know the, the the more that facilitates the the treatment and the you know and the and the cure of, of, of these various diseases. I already already had much to say about the FDA, you know uh, you know and and re respecting the freedom of MDs who read the medical journals and see when there are new pharmaceuticals coming on the market, to you know to to realize this may be helpful for this patient. Tell the patient that even if it's still in trial, the patient may choose, you know, if, if, if you're possibly dying from coronavirus and you have a, a chance at a, at, a, at a revolutionary new medication that may have side effects or, you know, it hasn't been tested for years, an adult patient may well choose to, to, to use that medication and to have the uh, FDA uh, re refuse to, to, you know, to respect that right, to, the FDA to violate that right is, is criminal. If any of you guys saw that Matthew McConaughey film, The Dallas Buyers Club, you know, it was very, it was very powerful on, on this theme. But I just want to make one point about Atlas Shrugging. If that means, you know, if we take that literally, it means, we, you know, uh, we're we going to shrug off our everyday careers and, you know, and try and establish uh, an enclave of freedom in the Colorado Rockies or, or, or somewhere else. I mean, in a free country or semi-free country, you are, we're free to do so. But I'd also, I'd also point out, you know, Dagny and Reardon, they're very reluctant, to put it mildly. I mean, they have, they have a career, not just a job. They, you know, they, you know, they're enormously creative and running you know, uh, on a grand scale, running transcontinental railroads, inventing new metals and stuff. You know, they're very reluctant to leave that, which is understandable. And my, you know, my point is, 
people are free to you know to try and establish a, 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 an enclave if, if if such such as blocks gulch if they like but we don't have to abandon the world yet so there was still you know it's been the point's been made a few times here already we're still free enough to speak out this you know and i think if i remember correctly somebody once asked Ayn rand you know about that about when it would be uh i used to i used to go to uh, uh, Leonard Peikoff's lectures in New York City in the 1970s when I was a kid in grad school. Ryan Rand would show up sometimes, you know, you know for the Q&A. And I, I think was, this goes back, you know, more than 40 years ago. I think she said, you know, in answer to that about when it would be time to shrug, she said, as, as long as there's freedom of speech, you know, you could still, you, you, there's, there's still an opportunity to, to, to work for uh, positive change. And that's one of many great things about the United States. I know a number of my friends in the UK have, have talked to me about this over the last few years. There's no constitutionally uh, protected right to freedom of speech, even in the UK, which is one of the freest countries in the world. And you could get sent to prison, right, for, like, for, for uh, uh, condemning Islam or, you know, is, you know uh, for, for, for jihadists. That doesn't happen in the United States, not yet. Uh, and so, you know, we're still, we're still free to speak out and, uh, you know, to write and to lecture and to speak and, and to use social media and to try and promote uh, Iron Man's ideas. And there's still, there's, I don't know how much time there's left before the First Amendment is abrogated and, and, and freedom of speech is, is restricted, curtailed and violated, but we still have it now. And I don't think there's, I don't think it's necessary to... Uh, escape to, a, to an enclave, uh, you know, a freedom in the Colorado Rockies or somewhere else. We can still fight for the world. There's, there, there's, there's still time. So, I mean, there's, there, there, is, there is a piece of, of good news here. And this applies to, you know, many parts of the, you know, of the, of the civilized world. And even in, even in the countries where there aren't constitutionally, you know, uh, protected uh, laws, or, uh, you know, constitutional amendment upholding freedom of speech, you can still you can still argue. I, my my guess is you you know in, in in the UK or in South Korea or in Israel, you know, and in a number of places around the world, you could argue for freedom. You mean you can't criticize Islam? There's a lot of polemics that you can't engage in. You know, you 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 can't criticize uh, the jihadists or something. But I think you could argue for freedom without you know without being threatened with the incarceration. So uh, I think we still have an opportunity to 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 make the the relatively free countries, free are. Thanks, Andy. Let's go to Bob. Bob, you're unmuted. Thank you. Uh, I raised my hand originally quite a while ago, and I wanted to integrate something that Liam said with something that Rob Trusinski was saying. And that was, uh, well, the, the general point, of course, is what we should all learn from this, what we hope everybody in America learns at least is that freedom is better. You get, you get rid of shortages with freedom. You have more productivity with freedom. And interestingly enough, there are a couple of concretes that Governor Cuomo uttered in his daily grief conference. Uh, the first one was a, a few, well, very early in the game when he learned that there would not be nearly enough hospital beds. He said, I'm waiving all the requirements that the hospitals currently have to have in order to have a hospital bed. And then a few conferences later than that, he said, boy, I got these ventilators. Uh, we had to pay extra money for them, but God bless gouging, <laughs> price gouging. Uh, now, so it's clear that there are lessons here, and very concrete, but what are the odds that Cuomo is not going to want to just have power? Because since then, of course, he's been very, uh, very vocal about, uh, well, Trump really ought to control more of these American industries and get them to give us what we need. Yeah. So that was my point. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. One of the interesting things I want to talk about is that I, I actually am on the side of saying that, you know, when it comes to the, some of the shutdowns, things like that, I think there are, a horrible sort of blunt instrument, I think is often badly implemented. On the other hand, it's one of those things where I'm not sure there's a, even a better alternative given the situation that we got into from the failure of the testing and the failure of, uh, uh, of uh, government to know what was going on and to be able to quarantine individuals. What I'm looking for out of political leaders though, when they, if to the extent they do a shutdown, is this sense that this is an abnormality that we want to get back to 
normal as soon as possible. I, there's a good speech given by a guy named uh, Jared Polis, who is the governor of, of uh, Colorado, basically saying, you know, this is this is a te- this, is, this is all temporary. Or we're struggling as fast as we can to get back to it. And he mentions the idea of testing and tracing and getting back to this point where we can quarantine individuals and not quarantine a whole society and get and and bring Colorado back to normal and and. He even talked about commerce being an essential of human life, and we need to be able to get back to commerce. So, uh, and, and in, in the UK, I saw a speech by a member of parliament, uh, I'm trying to remember there's Steve, Steve Baker, I think was the guy's name, basically, and he had this great line, it stuck in my head, where, um, and I actually used it as a part of a headline for an article I'm doing on this, which is, he said, what we're implementing in this bill, this is the bill they had to do all the shutdowns, what we're implementing in this bill is a dystopia. It's a dystopian society. And it says, you know, I, I'm going to vote for it because I think it's necessary for the temporary emergency, but we ought to get rid of it, uh, not last one moment longer than it has to. And he gave this very impassioned plea, and I think he was arguing specifically for the idea of putting a sunset provision, right? That these powers being given to government should automatically disappear at a certain date to make sure that we go, you know, that, that, con- that part, I was about to say Congress, that parliament has to come back and reauthorize and extend them if the emergency is still going, but that the default is that they disappear. I don't think he got that uh, put into the bill, but this sense that, you know, I do think the government has certain powers it, it can and probably should invoke under temporary emergency situations, but the, the context of the temporary, it's like wartime, the context of the temporary emergency has to be kept in, into place. And my big concern right now is that, you know, if this comes back in a second wave, um, uh, you know, in the fall or something like that, it's not going to be an unexpected emergency. It's going to be a predicted emergency. It's going to be something that we knew was happening and could have prevented. And so, uh, you know, what we really ought to be doing, I think that in terms of the political focus, should focus on you know, I do think the gov- because the government has a role here and one of its roles should be the idea, you know, it has a quarantine power that I think is a legitimate power of government. And its, its role should be to go back to a normal quarantine power, which is identifying infected, in, you know, like in the Black Plague, you, know, you identify this is a plague house, people aren't allowed to leave. You quarantine specific individuals for a limited period of time. And because this is a whole lot you know, less deadly than the plague, a lot, lot less contagious than the plague. It's, it, it would have a, a far fewer, like you know, orders of magnitude less impact on the economy, orders of magnitude less impact on people's lives if we actually had a system where we could quarantine individuals rather than quarantining, you know, everyone in the entire society in their houses for, for uh, an indefinite period of time. So, you know, this is the point where the government requires competence at its actual own core functions. And we're paying the price for so many decades of the government doing everything except its core functions. Let me ask a question here, because you know, I live in my Andy bubble and write books and essays, and I don't follow uh, you know, contemporary politics all that much because it's just, it either depresses me, a- outrages me, or both. So you know, I let like little snippets in you know, now and then from, you know, from, from people I know. So let me ask a question. I hear rumors that in Sweden, they didn't lock down the, the society like they have in, in, in a number of other countries. And that they, they didn't suffer any worse fate regarding the pandemic than, than in the countries that did lock down. Now, is that, is that accurate or is it, does anybody know? I checked it two days ago. So in terms of deaths per one million, Sweden is at number eight. But the weird thing is that Way above Sweden is Belgium, who has had a very tight lockdown. And way above Sweden, which means more deaths per million, you could see France, who has almost a martial law. Like it has a very strict, a very strict lockdown. So, I mean, Sweden is not among the countries that are doing the really, really well, but it's definitely not among the countries that are doing really, really bad. So, yeah, you could you could say specifically in terms of where Sweden is going to be in the day after, that its policy of not having a lockdown, the way it seems now, is not that bad. And also there's the added element that Sweden has a more, quote, liberal policy of, ha- of, of, of counting dead people. 
So, for example, if someone dies in a in a how is it called nursery house where like old people, yeah. So, if someone dies there, they immediately count them in the victims if they have evidence that they die from COVID. Whereas in other countries, they are incorporated later in the official records of death. So there are a lot, there's a lot of evidence that Sweden is doing relatively fine. Now, you know, we're recording this <laughs> on this day, maybe in three months. I understand, but thanks for the information, Nikos. But there's a data point, right? I mean, no, yeah, this is, this is, from, uh, this is from, 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 from what we got from... Uh, but again, quite often the media to, 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 to uh, emotionalize the news, they just give you the absolute number. So they say... Uh, United States has surpassed uh, Italy, and they don't tell you that the United States has like 300 million, and w way more than Italy. Anyway, Bob wants to come back uh, with, uh, with with another comment after his question, so I'll un Sorry, Andy, did you want to say something? That's a data point showing that free if, if, if that's accurate, and I, I suppose you're right, Nick, because that's a data point showing freedom works, you know, as a practical point, you know, and then statism, uh, statism is is not the best way to fight a fight a pandemic, you know. And you, it, it's interesting that we come from a mixed economy, semi-socialist welfare state, but then we're all mixed economy, semi-socialist welfare states, aren't we? But anyway, anyway, that, that's that's certainly a point to argue that the pandemic's going to run its course, and you don't shut down the economy uh, because we know there's going to be harmful long-term effects of shutting down the economy. And presumably, we'll see, but presumably Sweden will recover economically better than you know, or sooner or quicker than the rest of us. Let's go to Robert and then we go to Bob who has something else, has something more to add. Robert. Yeah, I want to do a quick thing on this because I have been following this pretty closely. Um, there, there's basically a, a couple different models for dealing with this. One is South Korea, which I said you know, is, is one of the most successful. And that's the idea that you, you jump early on to doing testing and tracing the contacts of the people who test positive and quarantining the individuals and not having to lock down everything else. Uh, Sweden's interesting because they haven't done the lockdowns, but they also are behind on testing like everybody else. So it's gonna be interesting to see how it works out. Now, in terms of deaths per million, they were below some of the other Nordic countries, which are sort of the, their neighborhood that was taken as, uh, as, as a comparison. They were below some of the other Nordic countries, then shot ahead some of, the, of some of the other Nordic countries. So there's a question of, well, are they going to pay a longer term price? Are they going to have to do more of a shutdown later on and extend the pain? So I'm, the jury's still out on that. Uh, what I will say, though, is that when you talk about government policies, the thing you have to take into account is a lot of the stuff is being done voluntarily. And uh, you know, so in South Korea, there's still social distancing. Right, they're just not doing it as draconian as draconian a way as we're doing in the U.S. or in the U.K. Uh, or in in Sweden, you know, Sweden's a very orderly, educated society. People are staying home more. They're not going out as much. They're staying, you know, they're, they're practicing uh, some of the uh, they're practicing a lot of the guidelines of social distancing, whether or not the government tells them to. And in the U.S., the problem I have with the lockdowns, it, well, the two problems I have with the lockdowns are. Uh, first of all, that I think there is a case to be made for the idea of, of educating people and telling them, look, this is what you should be doing. Here's, here's, how, here's why you should be doing social distancing. Here's how you should be doing and trust people to do it on their own out of their own self-interest. And then the second thing is when they've imposed lockdowns, they've often imposed lockdowns basically by the, it had a couple of prominent cases. The governor of Michigan did this, where it was sort of like the governor got on a power trip and decided to ban all sorts of things, shut down all sorts of things because she could. And the specific complaint people had there was that they were banning activities not based on their risk of infection, but simply based on whether the governor thought they were essential versus non-essential activities, which is a kind of arbitrary thing. So landscapers, you know, people who work outdoors by themselves, not near anybody else, were being told they couldn't work because their activity was non-essential, whether or not it would actually pose any kind of danger to anybody. So you can see how the, the politics get, the, when you make these political edicts, there's this very ham-fisted, uh, um, uh, unthinking blanket kind of restriction that's put on there without, in a sense, for, well, what is rational that people should not do versus what rationally can they do in a safe way? Thank you. So let's go to Bob. Bob, you are now unmuted. Just to 
almost facetious point is that the, the Swedes practiced social distance before the pandemic. Uh, and uh, also the, the Swedes don't have uh, a lot of cases where the kids live at home. They actually go away and are separate. So the, uh, the particular cultural habits of any particular country have a lot to do with what's going to happen in, this, in the statistics. Yeah, and I think that some of the good, better statistics you've seen in the Far East comes from the fact that some of these countries like Japan are obsessive about hygiene in, under normal circumstances, right? It's a, it's a no, little contact with other people and obsessively washing your hands and everything, the, the culture of cleanliness is much more developed there. Right, so I, I'll keep the privilege of the last question to myself because it will be like the nerdy kids question. So many thanks to Robert because what you said about Atlas Shrugged and Soviet Union was a big question I had, like why it's not there? Why? And then recently I reread, actually re-listened the With the Living and a question I had was why is Stalin not mentioned? So Lenin is mentioned, Trotsky is mentioned, but and Stalin, who at the time the book is out, has been the general secretary of the party for like since 22, and since 24, the equivalent of the prime minister is never mentioned in the book. So I was wondering what this is. But anyway, if you if anyone of you has an answer on this, that would be good. But I have a follow-up question on this. I have to look at the timeline, Nikos. I don't remember exactly what years the book took place in. It's after Lenin's death. And Stalin has been general secretary two years before Lenin died because Lenin had the stroke. So in the last two years of his life, he, he was basically, he wasn't really in charge. He, he was Stalin mostly- had un- not yet consolidated power, right? There was the power struggle with Trotsky that went on for, for several years. Right? Trotsky was already out of favor. That's why, if you remember, someone says to Andrei Taganov, uh, yeah, okay, you fought with Trotsky, but see what happened to Trotsky. So, you know, you, maybe you shouldn't be that proud of this now. So, so and, and by 36, when the book is out, is, is, but anyway, it's maybe one of the questions that, you know, if Rand was still around or if someone could ask Leonard Peikoff, that would be an interesting one. Ask Robert Trzinski, maybe he knows. Robert. My answer to that is, is, is something I noticed about the Fountainhead. She actually was like, Ayn Rand once said, she was like mortified at a mistake she made that she inter- that she used a brand name for something like uh, a, a Kleenex or, you know, no, it wasn't Kleenex. It was, it was Coca-Cola, but she mentioned Coca-Cola in, in, in the fact. Right, but Coca-Cola, you know, you can see, I, I think it was something else, but it was like a brand name of, a pro, of an ordinary household everyday product that of course nobody knows anymore because nobody uses it anymore. So, you know, if you use Kleenex or Coca-Cola, that stands the test of time. But she was mortified at this mistake she made of introducing some 1930s brand name that no, no longer, you know, would be recognizable because she was afraid of anything that would date that what she wrote, what would make it a, uh, a you know, a, too his, too much of a trapped in this is a historical time. Now, We the Living is different in that it is in a very specific historical time and you can actually place it to the events would have happened between this year and this year, roughly. Um, but it, part of it was she wanted to keep it from being tied down to the specifics of this one person being in power. So she wanted it to be something that would have universal applicability, applicability after Stalin was out of power. Now, she, I think she had no idea how long he would remain in, in 1936. Um, and also, there was, you know, there's this whole, you know, if you've looked at the apologists of communism uh, in the West, there's been this whole argument of, well, sure, Stalin was bad, right? But, but, but Lenin wasn't as bad, and Trotsky wasn't as bad, and if only somebody other than Stalin had been in charge, things, you know, the gulags wouldn't have happened. Now, you know, those who have studied it more know that every measure put in place by Stalin was first put in place by Lenin. It was central to their program. It was part of their ideology. So it doesn't really wash, but I, I have a feeling that that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to, she didn't want this to be an anti-Stalin story. She wanted it to be an anti-communist, an anti-Soviet Union, an, an anti-collectivist story. That makes sense. Thank you very much. That's, that's very useful. So I'm not, I'm not taking that from knowledge of having met Ayn Rand because I never did, but uh, just from, my knowledge of how she how she worked as a writer and the way the, some of the decisions she made. Right. Uh, Thank you. That makes sense. So my last qu- my other question and last question is, I want to push a bit on on Andy specifically. I don't know if Robert did it. So Andy, you mentioned the Chinese rulers as communists. 
And it's kind of the political scientist in, scientist in me who is not very happy with this. I mean, we can, we can agree that they're very, very bad people, but under which possible definition of communism would we say they're communists? So they still have the communist party because it's an excellent, in a horrible way, for them excellent, machinery of power, one of the most complicated and sophisticated machineries of power ever. That's why it makes no sense for them to change the title. But where's the reference to Marx? Where's, where's like the Marxist-Leninist ideology? So why calling them communists rather than authoritarian or something else? And that's a, I mean, that's a good question, Nikos. I remember uh, when Deng Xiaoping came to power after Mao's death in the, in the late 1970s, and he started privatizing you know, some elements of the Chinese economy, and the agricultural sector, and, and so on. And remember his famous uh, analogy when, he's, when he said, I, I don't care if the cat's white or black, as long as the cat's is mice. So, I mean, he said, I didn't care whether, you know, the economy had private ownership elements of capitalism or whether it was socialist. He just wanted to, to, to produce, produce wealth. And I think, you know, I, I think you're right. I think to a significant degree, the, the Communist Party leaders have given up on, on Marxist theory. I don't think that, that, I mean, Mao was an actual Marxist. I mean, he's actually, you know, he was a believer in, in, in the Marxist-Leninist uh, socialist theory. Since Deng Xiaoping, I don't know. I don't know that. Now, I don't know the contemporary crop because, like I said, I don't follow politics that well. But I, my my guess is that uh, I mean, I mean, they they've allowed so many elements of private ownership and prophecy by permission, not by not by right. Nevertheless, they've allowed that because they wanted you know pro, you know high degrees of prosperity, you know, in, in the country. So I mean, that certainly is not Marxism. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, I mean, they're not, they're not strict hardline Marxists anymore. So in that sense, it's a misnomer to call them communists, but I hate them so much. I like to call them communists. And anyway, no, you're right. There's still, there's still the element of, of brutal dictatorship, you know, uh, that's, that's certainly, you know, Marx and his heirs uh, stood for. But yes, strictly speaking, philosophically, they, uh, since Deng Xiaoping, they probably have not been Marxist. One thing I want to add is, is you might want to talk to, have, invite on uh, a guy named Robert Garmong, an old, old friend of mine I've known for a long time, uh, who has lived in China for the last 10 or 12 years now. Uh, he went there to teach years and years ago. And uh, he, when I talked to him, he said that he regards the com government of, of China as fascist. Is, you know, by any definition, the political science definition, it is a fascist government and not a communist one. But, you know, they keep the name for old time's sake because, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the communists have a, have a, um, a long history of, of being, defining themselves as being anti-fascist and against the fascists. And we're going to stop these evil fascists while being almost indistinguishable in practice from the fascists. Antifa, the United States, is a perfect example of that, right? I'm so tempted. Like I was thinking of this question yesterday. I was like, why didn't I ask Andy? So some year, some weeks ago, we did Andy's kind of book on heroism. And I would like to ask Andy on this because you mentioned fascist and communist. So at least in the public sphere narrative in Europe, the Red Army who defeated the Nazis in Stalingrad and then pushed them, you know, and then of course they occupied half of Europe. But so we can agree that, you know, the defense of Leningrad is heroic, the battle of, or not heroic, heroic like with the everyday use of the term. And the battle of Stalingrad is like a heroic endeavor. So could you say, Andy, that the defenders of Stalingrad were heroic? You know, I think, I think heroism is overwhelmingly a moral concept. And I think I agree entirely with Ayn Rand that uh, the, the basic, the, the essence of morality is, is what advances human life. So I don't think, you know, people who, who fight for mass murder, whether, what, you know, a good example of that was Otto Skorzeny, the, the, the uh, SS commando on Hitler. He was a friend of Hitler. He was, a, you know, he was this powerful warrior, you know, and everything. To the Nazis, he didn't hero, but on a rational basis, you're fighting for national socialism and mass murder. You're not a hero. Okay, what your dare you do is so that you know uh, people in 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 Russia fighting for freedom from the Nazis doing this, and you know they're they're fighting in in promotion of human life. I would consider them heroes. Hardcore communists 
who are sim simply fighting to oppose one form of mass murder. You know, you know, let's liberate us from the foreign mass murderers so we could be killed by the indigenous mass murderers. I don't care what their, 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 their dual exploits are. They're not heroes. Heroism is first foremost a, a, a moral concept. Robert, a, a comment on that? Andy's more the expert on that subject. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's also heroism is an individual concept, too, because you could say, you know, somebody acted heroically in the defense of Stalingrad in his own individual context, given what he was doing, but that, you know, the, the Red Army as a whole was not heroic. And, you know, interesting, interesting statistic I came up with. I was looking this up years and years ago. And, and, you know, one point behind this whole thing of, oh, the Red Army saved Europe is that when you look at World War II, most of the fighting and dying happened on the Eastern Front. You know, that millions and millions of, of, of soldiers died there, you know, more, far more than on the Western Front. Um, and, but the interesting thing about the statistics is if you look at the statistics for Germany, they say, there's this little footnote that says statistics include, you know, people killed, the, the statistics for German casualties includes people murdered by the Nazis. <laughs> and the statistics for the Russian casualties include uh, people killed in what were called NKVD disciplinary actions. In other words, people killed by their own army of their own government accounted as among the, the Russian uh, uh, casualties. There's no footnotes like that on the US casualties or the, the British casualties in World War II. And that gives you a sense for uh, the very different uh, causes and the very different governments involved. Yeah, and, and, and Rob, since, he, since I assume your family background is Polish, uh, you know, the Katyn Forest oh, yeah. massacres where the- Oh yeah. The Soviets butchered all of these leading Polish, you know, intellectuals who were, who were army officers because Stalin wanted to take over Poland when the war was over. They didn't want any you know, intellectual resistance, and they did the same thing, you know, in, in Russia. Those are the kind of people that you know that the Russian casualties of, of the communists. But I want to point something out here, just you know, quickly. Uh, this idea of the Red Army as heroic. Well. First of all, the, the Red Army would never have been able to fight its way out of Russia if it was not for massive American aid. You know, and the, on the Murmansk run, and uh, you know, you know the, the 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 Soviets had been whipped to a frazzle. The the best they could have gotten would have been a stalemate because of the because of the Russian winter. So that's one thing. And and Ludwig von Mises makes you got Ayn Rand's epistemological point: see phenomena in their full context, see the full context. Von Mises made the the uh, important point. I think it was in socialism that. Uh, the British and the Americans bombed German factories and cities round the clock, and uh, you know, you know the, the Russians weren't able to. You know, I don't remember when they finally crossed the Russian frontier into Poland. You know, uh, and they pushed westward, but it was several years of German occupation. By that time, the Americans and British had pounded German factories to rubble, and they had you know, they, and they had very little equipment left with which to fight on the you know on on the eastern front. So you got to see the the full context. The idea of the the Red Army, as you know, as as, as liberated in any sense, practical or moral, is just false. Well, although the encirclement of the German army in Stalingrad was before that, but anyway, let's go. Let's go to Bob for the last comment, and then I go back to Razi for his uh, goodbyes. Bob, I wanted to make uh, remind people of the philosophic point that all normative concepts can be. You have to assume, in some cases. Well, you have to know what the standard is for the normative, so that uh, Jesus was a, a hero according to some standards, but not by a rational standard. Yeah, by the standard of that which promotes human life, then communists and Nazis are villains. They're not, they're not right. heroes. Correct. Razi. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Nikos, uh, and a massive thank you to uh, both our speakers, Robert Trzinski and Andrew Bernstein. Um, we will have more discussions tying in Rand's fiction to current events and to, uh, you know, not so current events, but things that are uh, still relevant to our, our life. So I hope you'll join us for those. Uh, if you are uh, in the live event now uh, and you missed some of it or you missed some previous ones or you want to watch this again, the, uh, there's a link in the chat to our YouTube channel where you can subscribe and watch all these events. Uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube, as I mentioned in the description, uh, there's a link to the London Ayn Rand meetup, meetup where you can uh, join these events live. So uh, thanks again, everybody, and see you all soon. <laughs>